Wait, you already have a picture. Yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Yes. Boy, I'm telling you what, that chief left, left people home, didn't yeah. they? Chief. Well, the chief did. Uh -huh. Who had a heart attack last Sunday? I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For 10 seconds. Oh, yeah. like that. Was yeah. That was yeah. crazy. Yeah, my heart attack didn't even go with me no more. <laughs> <laughs> That was crazy. Oh, and we were just, we just kept saying more funny things and more funny things. Brian had a picture that said, this is how I looked when the Chiefs scored their last touchdown. <laughs> well, and Joe just, he gave up on him and he just went to the bathroom. I said, well, 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 I <laughs> Praise the Lord, we see how it goes
he didn't have no prior here going. Yeah! <laughs> I'm saving my praise for right now. Um, we all have had a life where we've done things in there that's really hard to do in our lives, right? I mean, if you think over your life, there are things that are that you have found hard to do. Um, one of the things for me that was hard to do was to quit smoking. No, not really. I, I smoked for a lot of years, and I set it down, never went back. All right, I was blessed that way, all right? Um, one of the very hardest things I've ever had to do was to quit cussing. It took a lot for me to stop, because I was raised in an environment where that was normal. It was normal for me, and then it compounded with the Army. It was difficult. But nothing I've ever done has been as hard as standing in my front door watching you guys over here. And I wasn't here. <laughs> and I'm being serious. I'm, I was probably like a dog standing at the door with his tail wagging waiting for it. Man, that was... <laughs> just, yeah, exactly. The only reason I bring that up as a phrase is because how blessed am I that I can feel that way. Because I wasn't that way 20, 30 years ago. You know, I, I wouldn't have cared. But now I do. So praise God for that change of heart that He's given me. All right. With that being said, let me pray and we'll get started here. Heavenly Father, I come to you today on my knees with humility and gratitude and asking for help today, Father, as always with this message. Father, uh, your word means everything to me and to us. And Father, I just plead with you for help when we discuss your business that it honors you and that it's accurate. It represents what you once said, Father. And I need your help with that. Please, Father, I just invite you into this message and just help me with the words that I'm going to say today. And finally, Father, I just come to you with the gratitude of words that I don't know how to say for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for all of us. I can't say it, Father. How, how touched I am that you love me as much as you do to forgive me of my sins. I just don't have the words, Father. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful day. Thank you for these people in this room, Father. Thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All righty, friends. Today we're going to continue. Now, it's been a couple weeks since you had to hear me, right? So we're going to continue this theme of doing the will of our Father. And we have a power word for today. And that power word is separation. Now we're going to venture back to a time a long time ago, to a time when God made a covenant with Abram, who would later be called Abraham, right? But at first he was called Abram, or Avram. I'm going to use Abraham the rest of the morning here just because it's easier, all right? I can just keep doing that here. Um, excuse me. And we're going to talk about how this exact moment in antiquity gives us a really good example of how to do the will of God. Or in other words, how to love, serve, and obey our Father. Now, again, I'm not using this word Abraham all day long, so please forgive me if that just seems weird, but I'm just going to use Abraham. So we're going to be in Genesis today, chapter 12 of Genesis. But it is absolutely crucial. It is critical for all of us to understand what happened in the world before Abraham met God. This understanding is needed so we can properly understand why God made this covenant. As well as we can better understand why Abraham <coughs> did the actions that he did. Now we're not going to read chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis today. That's a lot of reading, right? But we need to understand what went on between 1 and 11. So, we're going to watch a video. It's a 7 minute video, but I promise it's very quick. Easy to understand, and you're going to enjoy, I think, the presentation of this video here. This video is put out by a group called The Bible Project. Let's check it out so we can create this foundation for what we're going to talk about today. The book of Genesis. It's the first book of the Bible, and its storyline divides into two main parts. There's chapters 1 through 11, which tell the story of God and the whole world. And then there's chapters 12 through 50, which zoom in and tell the story of God and just one man, Abraham, and then his family. And these two parts are connected by a hinge story at the beginning of chapter 12. And this design, it gives us a clue to how to understand the message of the book as a whole and how it introduces the story of the whole Bible. 
So the book begins with God taking the disorder and the darkness described in the second sentence of the Bible, and God brings out of it order and beauty and goodness. He makes a world where life can flourish. And God makes these creatures called humans, or Adam in Hebrew. He makes them in his image, which has to do with their role and purpose in God's world. So the humans are made to be reflections of God's character out into the world. And they're appointed as God's representatives to rule his world on his behalf. Which in context means to harness all of its potential, to care for it, and make it a place where even more life can flourish. God blesses the humans. It's a key word in this book. And he gives them a garden, it's like a place from which they begin starting to build this new world. Now the key is that the humans have a choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And that's represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Up till now, God has provided and defined what is good and what is not good. But now God is giving the humans the dignity and the freedom of a choice. Are they going to trust God's definition of good and evil, or are they going to seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves? And the stakes are really high. To rebel against God is to embrace death because you're turning away from the giver of life himself. This is represented by the tree of life. And so in chapter 3, a, a mysterious figure, a snake, enters into the story. The snake's given no introduction other than it's a creature that God made. And it becomes clear that it's a creature in rebellion against God, and it wants to lead the humans into rebellion and their death. The snake tells a different story about the tree and the choice. It says that seizing the knowledge of good and evil are not going to bring death, that it's actually the way to life and becoming like God themselves. Now the irony of this is tragic because we know the humans, they're already like God. They were made to reflect God's image. But instead of trusting God, the humans seize autonomy. They take the knowledge of good and evil for themselves and in an instant, the whole story spirals out of control. The first casualty is human relationships. The man and the woman, they suddenly realize how vulnerable they are now. They can't even trust each other. And so they make clothes and they hide their bodies from one another. The second casualty is that intimacy between God and the humans is lost. So they go and run and hide from God. And then when God finds them, they start this game of blame shifting about who rebelled first. Now right here the story stops and there's a series of short poems where God declares to the snake and then to the humans the tragic consequences of their actions. God first tells the snake that despite its apparent victory, it is destined for defeat to eat dust. God promises that one day a seed or a descendant will come from the woman who's going to deliver a lethal strike to the snake's head. Which sounds like great news, but this victory is going to come with a cost because the snake too will deliver a lethal strike to the descendant's heel as it's being crushed. It's a very mysterious promise of this wounded victor. But in the flow of the story so far, you see this is an act of God's grace. The humans, they've just rebelled. And what does God do? He promises to rescue them. But this doesn't erase the consequences of the human's decision. So God informs them that now every aspect of their life together at home and out in the field, it's going to be fraught with grief and pain because of the rebellion, all leading to their death. From here, the story then spirals downward. Chapters 3 through 11, they trace the widening ripple effect of the rebellion and of human relationships fracturing at every level. So there's a story about two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain's so jealous of his brother that he wants to murder him. And God warns him not to give in to the temptation, but he does anyway. He murders him in the field. So Cain then goes on to build a city where violence and oppression reign. And this is all epitomized in the story of Lamech. He's the first man in the Bible to have more than one wife. He's accumulating them like property. And then he goes on to sing a short song about how he's more violent and vengeful than Cain ever was. After this, we get an odd story about the sons of God, which could refer to evil angelic beings, or it could refer to ancient kings who claimed that they descended from the gods. 
And like Lamech, they acquire as many wives as they wanted, and they produce the Nephilim, these great warriors of old. Whichever view is right, the point is that humans are building kingdoms that fill God's world with violence and even more corruption. In response, we're told that God is broken with grief. Humanity is ruining his good world, and they're ruining each other. And so out of a passion to protect the goodness of his world, he washes it clean of humanity's evil with a great flood. But he protects one blameless human, Noah, and his family, and he commissions him as a new Adam. He repeats the divine blessing and commissions him to go out into the world. And so our hopes are really high, but then Noah fails too, and also in a garden. He goes and he plants a vineyard, and he gets drunk out of his mind. And then one of his sons, Ham, does something shameful to his father in the tent. And so here we have our new Adam, naked and ashamed just like the first, and the downward spiral begins again. It all leads to the foundation of the city of Babylon. The people of ancient Mesopotamia, they come together around this new technology they have, the brick. And they can make cities and towers bigger and faster than anybody's ever done before. And they want to build a new kind of tower that will reach up to the gods, and they will make a great name for themselves. It's an image of human rebellion and arrogance. It's the garden rebellion now writ large. And so God humbles their pride and scatters them. Now this is a diverse group of stories, but you can see they're all exploring the same basic point. God keeps giving humans the chance to do the right thing with his world, and humans keep ruining it. These stories are making a claim that we live in a good world that we have turned bad, that we've all chosen to define good and evil for ourselves, and so we all contribute to this world of broken relationships, leading to conflict and violence and ultimately death. But there's hope. God promised that one day a descendant would come, the wounded victor who will defeat evil at its source. And so despite humanity's evil, God is determined to bless and rescue his world. And so the big question, of course, is what is God going to do? And the next story, The Hinge, offers the answer. But for now, that's what Genesis 1-11 through 11 is all about. Isn't that a good explanation of chapters 1-11 through 11 in a real short amount of time, you get a very clear picture of what's going on here with God, right? So, <clears throat> now that we have correct perspective of verses 1 through 11 of God's Word, let's now move to the covenant of Abraham. That's what chapter 12 is. Now we can understand what our focus scripture of today is, which is Genesis 12, verses 1 through 5. So let me read these verses real quick here. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went away as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, and all the possessions which they had accumulated, and the people with which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of of Canaan. So now Abraham makes sense. When you know what happened in the world before Abraham, when we get to Abraham, you now have correct perspective of why Abraham is in this story. It's not an accident. What we see here is God handpicked. He chose a specific person to make a covenant with. This covenant God made with Abraham started a process. What was the process that was started with Abraham? The covenant set in motion God's redemption plan. Is that better? Is it too much, too much echo? So that covenant set in motion God's redemption plan. There are no human words, friends, that we can come up with that express the force of this covenant. We can say things like it's a promise, 
or it's a contract, or it's a doctrine, or it's a will and testament. But all those words are very weak. They are inferior man-made descriptions. They cannot fully explain the power of God's promise. A covenant of God has at its source the very Spirit of God. Therefore, friends, if that's a true statement, therefore, nothing, nothing can be more certain in any situation in the world as the certainty and the purpose of this covenant and how it's going to be carried out. It is a promise that cannot be broken. It can't be broken because God decreed it. Now, Abraham is in the first of a series of men called the patriarchs. The patriarchs are Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, right? I got the wrong word. It's actually Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this is a father, a son, and a grandson. These are the patriarchs. Abraham and his family were just as pagan as the rest of the world at this time that we're talking about. He was not righteous before God. Especially before God got a hold of him. Now remember, Noah was pronounced by God as different than all other men, right? God pronounced him as the most righteous man in the world during that time. That he was different from all other men. So God chose him to start things over. God chose him and handpicked him. But that didn't turn out very well, did it, for Noah and mankind? It did not turn out too well at all. We get no indication in Scripture of any righteousness of Abraham. It's not in there. Abraham was a man who was very far away from God's righteousness. He was a man of the world. He was a man of other religions, idols. He was certainly not a man of Yahweh. Now, it's an understatement to say that God rocked Abraham's world when he chose it. That's an understatement. What God commanded Abraham to do was to separate himself from the world and his past ways. God determined that what Abraham was going to have to do as part of this covenant could not be accomplished by remaining among his own people, including some of his own family. So why did God command Abraham to separate? Why did he command him to do that? Because some of these people that Abraham was surrounding himself with were people who dedicated their lives to different religions, to different gods and different idols. That's why God separated him. So Abraham had to divorce himself from his old way of life. He had to do this so he could serve and obey God. How do you know that's why he had to do that? Because he wouldn't have separated him if he could have. If it didn't happen the way it did, then it wasn't going to end up the way it was supposed to end up, which I'll get to here in a little bit. Now, have you noticed there is a consistent pattern throughout antiquity of God electing, dividing, and separating people from their current circumstance to accomplish his needs? It's a pattern. He separated Noah from the rest of the world because of the way mankind was acting. We know that, right? He separated it from them. And God did the same thing with Abraham. God separated Abraham from the rest of the world to be the first man of a new nation of people, a people who would be what? Set apart just for God. It's not hard to imagine that Abraham would have had doubt, <coughs> angst, trepidation, probably scared with these instructions from God. Change was to rule the day. Change was to rule the day. And we all know what we think about change, right? It's probably no different for Abraham than it was that it is for us. Do you think when God approached Abraham and separated him out as the father of this new group of people, his chosen people, that Abraham immediately became this pure, unblemished man that instantly stopped all those pagan practices that had molded his character for his first 75 years? That didn't happen. Abraham had to learn how to separate himself from his old ways. He had to learn to be obedient to God and transform his life into a life that pleases God. A life of obedience and faith. This new template, this new template from thousands of years ago for Abraham has carried over into today. It's the same template for us, friends. Change rules the day. 
Now, Abraham was elected and divided by God. But that hardly means that all those ingrained thoughts that he had of his previous years of life, in other words, it's his baggage that I'm talking about, all that package did not just simply disappear, did it? It did not. If it would have disappeared, God would not have separated him because he wouldn't have needed to. He still had his baggage that he had to deal with. Abraham surely faced the same hardships that we all face when we sanctify our life with Christ. When God gets a hold of us and we become one of those elect, we must divide ourselves from the world. We all know that's hard for us to do. We just hate to let go of familiar things, don't we? We don't like letting go of that stuff. We all, even, I mean, even if those familiar things hurt us or they destroy us, it is hard for us to get rid of them. The security that we have with our familiar circumstances, no matter how terrible they are or how hollow they are, somehow in our minds, it's somehow better than the discomfort of facing a future of change. We just don't like change. We don't like it. We don't even like to change the seats that we sit in at church today. You're in the same seat you were last week, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how much we hate change. So, all right. Now, <clears throat> Jimmy, and this is why sometimes when left to our own devices, we often try to move forward into a life of renewal. You know what I'm talking about. Into a life of obedience with God. But we still try to stay latched to the old ways. We still try to stay latched to those things we need to leave behind because we don't like change. Changing or separation in one form or another is a prerequisite to serving and obeying God. To do the will of God, you have to change yourself from your old ways, from your old circumstances. If you want to serve God, friends, you have to begin a life of transformation from the old into the new. <clears throat> Excuse me. It doesn't matter how painful that change is or that separation is, you must do it if you want to do the will of God. Serving and obeying God may mean you have to force yourself to deal with separation from old friends who do not share the same values of God. you got friends like that, don't you? Yeah. Or perhaps you need to contend with separation from outside influences such as TV, internet, separation from influences that do not need to be in your life. Perhaps maybe the separation needs to be from a church or from a ministry that has over its time lost its first love. We know who our first love is, right? Churches lose their first love. So maybe you need to separate from those kind of situations here. The change, no matter what it is, is different for everybody. It's not the same. But please, friends, make no mistake about it. Doing the will of God involves separation and change in one's life. Now this concept of separation is, of course, central in our Messiah's teachings. Although it is not usually recognized by a lot of people, you don't hear a lot of preaching about it. Our Savior makes several statements about separation that causes uneasiness with us believers. And here's the classic one I'm going to read to you. In Luke 14, 26, we read this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and this is critical, friends, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's the words of your Savior right there. This is serious business, friends. Jesus isn't playing around here. He's telling us exactly how it is. Our Savior says, you cannot be his disciple if you do not change your life from the old wicked ways to the new life. Out of his mouth. Now, serving God, obeying God, loving God, all this is tied into separation and change. We, all call, we also call this process another word. It's a $10 word, not a 50 cent word. All right, so I'm going to give you a $10 word. It's called sanctification. We've all heard that, right? Sanctification. And in Genesis 12, we see Abraham having to deal with this act of sanctification. This act of obedience to God by separating himself from his current situation. 
Just like Abraham, we followers of God, we must also prepare to be at odds with those people and those situations that are closest to us. And that's hard to do, friends. It's extremely hard to do. But it's necessary. It's necessary for our sanctification. We must recognize that we can no longer remain tied to the past, particularly a wicked past. We must recognize that God's calling surpasses any other purpose for our existence. When God gets a hold of us, we now serve God. We don't serve this anymore. That's what we're talking about here. So let's listen to more of what Jesus would say on this particular subject. We read in Matthew 10, verses 34 through 36 this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be the members of his household. Our Messiah is saying that. In Bible speak, many of the members of Abraham's household became his enemies because he was called by God to abandon everything that he held dear to himself and to become God's man for a special <coughs> assignment. Christ came to divide and separate like no other person before him. The sword spoken of by Jesus is not so much a symbol of killing somebody, right? It's a symbol of dividing, of division. And he recognizes, Jesus recognizes that for some people, the circumstances for their being set apart for him are going to be heartbreaking. They're going to be hard to do. That's why he says what he says here in Matthew 19, 29 through 30, this. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much. And will what? Inherit the kingdom of God. Inherit life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Separation, friends. Separation, which is often expressed in the Bible using words like set apart, or sanctified, or distinction. They must occur in one form or another if one is to be a believer who does the will of God. This is because when you become saved, when you belong to Jesus Christ as a result of salvation, you become holy. And what is the definition of the word holy? Set apart. That's what holy means. <clears throat> Loving and obeying God involves changing your life. As God calls you to change it, you have to be willing to accept changes God decrees fit for you. So how do we begin, friends? How do we begin this life of change? We start by believing the Lamb of God, Jesus of Nazareth, as the Messiah. That's where we start. The plan of salvation that God sent to every one of us. Now, do you remember that story in the video where God's telling the world that He is sending a descendant who is coming to crush the snake, the adversary? That person is His Son, Jesus of Nazareth. After we accept His Son, we then do what? We repent of our wicked past, and we change. We turn around. We sanctify our walk with our Father. We are to become holy, just like our Father is holy. Our sanctification centers around the teachings of our Messiah and applying them to God's original written word. Remember when we learned last time I was up here about how a new patch must be conditioned so it can be properly applied to the old garment? That's what we're talking about here. And do you also see, friends, how this ties into what Jesus is talking about when he says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God except those who do the will of God will enter. Doing the will of God involves changing your past, separating yourself from the world. It's your deliberate act of what? Of being holy. Now Abraham was chosen by God. He was elected by God for a purpose. Have you been chosen by God for a purpose? Think about it. Have you been chosen by God for a purpose? Have you felt the nudge of God electing you to change your life? 
to separate yourself from the world and become a member of the flock of His Son, Jesus Christ. If you have accepted that invitation, you better believe God has chosen you for a purpose. Because He has. He's chosen you for a purpose. How favored are you if you have been elected by God for His purpose and His will? Praise God for that if you're one of those. If you have felt that invitation, that nudge from God, but you haven't taken the step to separate yourself, it's time. It's time to do it right now. It's time to change your disposition and separate from the world and start doing the will of our Father. It's time to accept the compassion, the mercy, and the grace being offered to you and to me through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who crushed Satan, the one who has the authority to forgive you, me, and everyone of disobedience to our Holy Father. The one who can change us from our worldly ways. Who can move us past our wicked past. Into a life of obedience and love to our Father. Jesus Christ will change you forever and ever. Forever and ever. Is there anyone out there right now who needs to? Who wants to publicly accept the invitation from God? We're all saved, right? We have all accepted that already, so. So then there's only one thing left to say, friends, and that is this. Praise God for His compassion and mercy on us. Amen. Amen. Wow, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. You came back with a bag, didn't you, kiddo? <laughs> you sure is, wasn't you? <laughs> yeah, this is I'm sure. I guess they both. <laughs>
for that particular day. And Father, I thank you for uh, the, the leadership that you have offered us. And I pray that we're accepting it as you would have us to accept that and act upon it. <clears throat> and Father, I just, I, I just want to pray for those that uh, couldn't be here today. I ask you to just to touch them and, and I don't want to make them feel bad at all. I just want you to bless them. And, they, and even though they missed the service this morning for various reasons. And Father, again, I, I lift uh, uh, each one and the ones that uh, need your blessing. Uh, and we all do need your blessing, Father. But help us in the mornings as we get out of bed that we stand up and say, God, I'm reporting for duty. <coughs> and again, I just ask you to bless our pastor. He's doing a marvelous job. And I thank you for him and for his messages. I ask you to help us to apply each one of those. And again, Father, as we leave the sanctuary, I just want you to remind us that we're entering the mission field. And there's a lot of folks out there that need your love. So I pray that you bless them as well. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.